And officially, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining Corporate College's webinar series, Live with the Experts. Each session is really geared towards providing you relevant information, tools, topics, everything you need to support you and set you up for success. Adjusting to this new norm is really a daily occurrence now, and shifting to a new reality of remote working, learning, and living does present its challenges. Here at Tri-C, we're committed to serving you during this rapid time of change and providing actionable resources to help you and your team succeed and thrive wherever your team is located, whether they're still at the work site or working remotely. Our webinar series is one of Corporate College's newest resources to prepare the workforce to overcome challenges and achieve both personal and business goals. Our series focuses on four primary themes with today's session related to personal health and well-being. You'll find other sessions related to virtual leadership, how to work better remotely, and even navigating a transition. But as many of you know, Corporate College has a very distinguished and talented team of facilitators and subject matter experts. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter and facilitation specialist, Chris Fasciana. Chris has leveraged his expertise in fitness, nutrition, stress management, and health coaching for nearly 15 years. While working in a variety of industries, Chris designed one-on-one -on -one health coaching services, wellness challenges, and strength and conditioning programs for a variety of organizations, uh, reaching from organizations with cardiac rehabilitation, corporate wellness programs, and education programs. Joining Cuyahoga Community College in 2011, Chris started the wellness coordinator before transitioning over to academics as the program manager for the sports and exercise studies program. That program today has two branches in it involving over 170 students and 130 clients. That's a lot, of, that's quite a big program. So with that, I'm very pleased to present to you, Chris Fasciano. Hi, Chris. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Hey, how's it going? I'm doing pretty well today. Thank you. How about You're you? Fine. Audio is good. You're good. You're good. Very good. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm excited uh, to talk to you about my favorite subjects, of course. Uh, we're going to be talking about improving your health and well being. Uh, I know that the title says during the pandemic, but it's going to be general health and wellness advice that you could use pretty much any time. So hopefully you guys will take a lot out of this webinar here. Definitely encourage you guys to ask questions. I've been assured that if you ask a question, it's sent, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yep, Not to all questions. panelists. Mm -hmm. To all panelists, yeah. So um, I'll be sure to definitely uh, try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, but why don't we go ahead and start first with, uh, talking about what health and wellness is. It's really a whole bunch of areas, not just one. So there's exercise, there's the diet part, and there's stress management. And, you know, there's, you know, people out there that uh, sometimes I even fall into this trap where I only focus in on one or two of those areas and not all three. Uh, there's definitely gonna be more areas beyond the exercise, diet, and stress but um, it's really important that we try to incorporate all of those when we're, when we're looking at improving our overall health. Uh, so the first part of the webinar today, we're gonna talk about exercise. That's kind of my go-to area. And then uh, we'll transition over, we'll talk some nutrition tips, and then we'll talk a little bit about stress management too. So uh, again, welcome everybody. All right, so how to start an exercise program? So starting an exercise program is really made up of a couple different areas. Uh, you might be someone out there that's just the cardio person. You know, you just like going for your walks or going for, you know, long runs, riding your bike. That's just one area within the exercise realm. Uh, so we're going to focus it on that first, but then we'll talk about the other areas of uh, exercise that you should be trying to incorporate into your routine. So I really want to make this as customizable to everyone on the call. 
Uh, you know, I want to talk about just starting an exercise program, but I also want to help those out there that are looking to kind of take their fitness to the next level. So, you know, if I could provide a couple more tips for you guys out there and, uh, you know, really improve your, your exercise routine. Uh, but the first area, like I said, we're going to focus on is how to start a cardiovascular exercise program. So when it comes to the recommendations that we get from, you know, doctors and from the national level, this is what they call the fit principle for cardiovascular exercise. Now, this is going to relate to your normal, healthy uh, individual out there. Um, it's this cardiovascular exercise uh, recommendation that you see on the screen is really for someone that doesn't really have too many chronic conditions. And it's, it's just a good target for you guys to try to shoot for. Um, it does get modified if you do end up having some type of chronic condition. But again, this is just general exercise advice here. So the FIT principle, what it stands for, uh, the F is for frequency, like how often are you supposed to exercise? I is for intensity, so how intense your workouts are. And then T is for time, so how long should you exercise for? And then the final T is type, which is what should you do? So looking at the first one, for the cardiovascular exercise, we recommend that you have <clears throat> a frequency of moderate intensity exercise for at least five days a week. And we're going to talk about the differences between moderate intensity and vigorous intensity in just a little bit. And there is math involved. So those of you who registered for the webinar, not knowing that they were going to have to do math, there's math coming your way. So we're going to talk about modern intensity, vigorous intensity, because that's going to help to determine how many days a week you should get that cardiovascular exercise. So there is, um, for the modern intensity, you need to do the cardio at least five days a week. For vigorous intensity, the good news is you don't have to do it as often, but it's going to be a harder workout. And then if you're doing a combination of the two, they recommend three to five days a week of doing the cardio. So we're going to take a deeper dive into those intensities because that's going to determine how many you should do uh, during the week. Uh, what I don't recommend, uh, hopefully there's not too many of you guys on the call that are like this. We call them our weekend warriors. Those are the people that don't do anything exercise wise Monday through Friday and then Saturday and Sunday they go out and they kill it. You know, they they run their, you know, 13 miles or they'll do long bike rides. Um, the problem with that is it could lead to basically some things that we don't want you to have, you know, overuse injuries, um, you know, just because you're going from doing nothing all week to ramping up to this very vigorous intensity. Uh, that's going to be really something that you'd want to look out for uh, when you're, you know, kind of planning out your week and seeing what days of the week you should, you should exercise. So don't be that weekend warrior. Try to spread it out a little bit more. It'll help to reduce the amount of musculoskeletal injuries that you might get from just doing the two days a week back to back. So don't be that weekend warrior. Um, the other Common question I get when it comes to frequency, so I'm kind of just uh, you know going ahead here, um, is how much is too much? Uh, so for some people, especially the runners that are out there, they're like, can I run every single day um, and still be okay? Um, for like the you know like elite athletes and and you know people in those kind of categories, yeah, that's that's okay. But for us general people. Um, you know, doing the, the running portion every single day of the week could really take a toll on the body. So just thinking about like, you know, if you're running outside, um, the impact that'll have in your joints, you could still do cardiovascular work every single day. And that's not a big issue. You just have to learn how to cross train. So in other words, some days, like maybe three days a week, you run, uh, two days a week, you go for a bike ride. You walk the other two days. So you, you could, in theory, get uh, seven days a week of cardio, but just making sure that if you're doing a high impact activity, 
that you know you you don't do it every single day of the week because that's where you get those overuse injuries. Um, so that's a little my little side note on the frequency, um, the intensity. Like I said, we're going to talk about some wonderful math equations, and uh, then we'll talk about um, next up is the uh, the first T, which is the time. So you could see that if it's a moderate intensity workout that you pretty much only have to do the 30 to 60 minutes, which is breaks down to about 150 minutes of cardiovascular exercise a week. And then the vigorous intensity work would be about 20 to 60 minutes a day or about 75 minutes a week. So the vigorous intensity, if you do that, not only do you have to not do it as often, the duration of the workouts is gonna be shorter. A uh, common question I get with in like how long you're supposed to go and which one should you, you know, increase first? Should it be the uh, the duration of the the workout or or the intensity? The big key is before you change anything with your workout, add to the duration first. You don't want to make it. You don't want to change your workouts by making it more intense without changing the duration first. So that's going to be really, really important. So again, it's just we're just thinking about it from an injury prevention standpoint. Um, we want you guys to increase the time portion first before you get that intensity up. And then the types of exercise. So this is always a fun one for me. Um, I always, I always hear people um, that I either work with or um, you know clients of ours, and they're like, "Well, I just hate cardio." I'm just not a cardio person. So that that always uh, you know kind of um, like, well, did you did you try everything? I mean, there's multiple different types of cardiovascular exercise that you could do. Um, the most simplest one is just walking. So walking, you know, doesn't require fancy equipment, you know, just a good pair of shoes and you're good to go. Uh, but some people are like, well, walking is boring. So then you have to try to find something that you actually enjoy to do. Um, you know, there's, you know, spinning workouts, elliptical. Uh, these are kind of what you tend to hear about when you hear cardiovascular exercise. Those are just some of the types of exercises that, that people enjoy to do. Uh, even I even encourage you guys in the chat, if you are, uh, uh, if you have like a favorite type of cardiovascular exercise that's not listed on the slide, definitely type it in because uh, it's always good just to brainstorm different solutions with with either clients or people that we work with to see, to find something that you actually enjoy to do. Because if you enjoy to do it, guess what, you'll do it. But if you're one of those people that like, well, I hate walking on the treadmill. Well, you're probably not going to stick with it. Um, I see a couple of uh, people chiming in on the chat. I love it. Uh, dancing. Dancing is an excellent way to, to get the cardiovascular exercise in. I'm not a really good dancer, but I like to, you know, move around. Um, so that's always a good one. The American College of Sports Medicine actually um, uh, classifies dancing as a really good form of cardiovascular exercise. Um, so pound class, swimming, swimming's a really good one. So those of you who do have, you know, problems with um, arthritis, swimming is really great because it helps to, the buoyancy of the water makes it more low impact on your joints. So uh, not only that, but here's a fun fact. We have our fun fact of the webinar so far. Uh, you actually burn more calories in the water than you do on land. So you could do the exact same activity in the water. You're going to burn more calories that way. I see some Zumba. I haven't done that one yet. Um, cycling. So yeah, lots of great stuff. Uh, YouTube videos. So just a lot of different options out there. Um, so what I'm going to do next is kind of talk about one of my favorite things to do for cardiovascular activity. Um, I am a zombie fan. I just love zombie movies, um, zombie video games, you know, anything zombie related, I'm a big fan of. 
Uh, they actually have, and I found this, uh, you know, just looking on on my uh, on my phone. They have an app called Zombies Run. I'm like, hmm, I like to run, and I like zombies. So I'm like, oh, I'll check it out. I always look at the the app reviews, and I looked at the the app reviews for Zombies Run, and it was really good. It was like five stars, and I'm like, well, this is perfect. Well, I gotta download it. So I download it and I go out for a couple runs with this thing. And it's, in my opinion, awesome. So if you're a zombie lover out there, give it a try. The way it works is you, it uses your phone um, and it gives you like a mission. Like your mission might be to, you know, go run and get uh, supplies for the base camp and you get the supplies for the base camp. But as you run, you have your headphones in and it's giving you like the narrative of the story. It um, it tells you, or like as you're running, it's like you picked up, you know, a gallon of water or you picked up uh, toilet paper, which is very, uh, you know, scarce these days. So so I, I'm running and I'm um, running and then all of a sudden in my headphones, there's like a faint sound of zombies, you know, they're like, oh, zombies. Um, and then they get louder the slower you are. So the, if you run a little bit faster, it's going to cause the zombie sound to get you know more faint in your earphones. And it goes based off your phone. So the more that you run, or the faster that you run with your phone, you know it, the it, that's how it determines how close the zombies are. So uh, very. I know you're all probably thinking like this guy is weird. Um, but it's a very fun thing, you know, don't knock it till you try it, but it combines something that, you know, I kind of like running, but it's not like my favorite activity, but this made it to something that I found to be very enjoyable. So it kind of, you know, fits with my, um, uh, you know, just my style, I guess. So the run zombies is, uh, something that I do, um, uh, again, you just need the app for that. Uh, nothing too too crazy. Uh, I'm also a video game nerd, so all you video video game nerds out there, yeah. Um, I play video games. I'll have my stationary bike inside, you know, my house, and all my TV, and I'll just play video games. So something I don't really like to do the indoor stuff. Um, you know, if it's really bad weather wise out here, um, you know, then I'll do. Uh, you know, just, you know, hop on the bike, play my favorite zombie video games, of course, and uh, just go for it. Uh, also, Netflix, so, you know, same thing. You know, if you have, put, put your exercise equipment in front of the TV, if you have exercise equipment, you know, just binge watch some shows, uh, but do so while you're, while you're moving, which is really important. So like everyone else, I got hooked on uh, Tiger King. I know that's a big thing. Uh, so in the chat, just let me know if you think that Carol Baskin killed her husband. No spoilers. Um, so, um, yeah, just looking at some of the questions here, uh, like rowing. Rowing is a really good activity because someone did ask, um, let's see, how do you evaluate how and when to start with low impact and move to high impact activities? So that's a really good question. Uh, from going from low impact to high impact, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, rating a perceived exertion scale that you could use to kind of determine subjectively whether you think it's time for you to, to, to bump it up. I highly recommend that you, um, that you actually go and you know, just start off with the low impact and then work your way up to high impact. So, um, the, the timing of it's going to really depend on you because you know your body the best. And if you're feeling like, all right, I've been doing the slow impact thing for, for quite some time and, uh, you know, I feel fine. And then you try a high impact, you know, workout and you just don't feel right. Then you, you bump it back down. Um, so what are some good activities for low impact for older folks? Uh, so for in these times, it's, it's really the walking is going to be the most economical and also, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, just ease and reducing barriers, walking is going to be the best, in my opinion. Uh, if you have low back pain, 
walking is going to be a really good activity just to just to help loosen those uh, lower back muscles. So um, walking is my personal favorite low impact. Uh, someone even put chair yoga. That's that's a really good one, but that's not really going to fall, unfortunately, into that cardiovascular category. Uh, but that would be great for for flexibility and low back pain. Um, and then if you do have access to equipment, if you're older, um, non weight bearing activities are going to be really important for you. So riding your bike uh, or riding a stationary bike, uh, recumbent bikes are great because they have the low back support. Um, ellipticals, are, they're okay, but you have to be careful with the ellipticals. A lot of people really tense up, especially when they use the, the arm component of the, the elliptical. Uh, they'll just, you know, really tense up and that causes a lot of times like neck pain for a lot of people if you're not used to working on an elliptical. So walking, riding a uh, stationary bike or riding a bike, that's going to be really good low impact activity. Uh, here's another question here. Are there any exercises that one could do at their desk, which would be a part of that fit principle? Uh, so someone's got a standing desk. They're wondering if that makes a difference. I also have a nice standing desk here as well. Big fan. Um, it's not going to help with this particular fit principle for the cardio. Um, it might help a little bit with the uh, the flexibility component and then just making sure your posture is in really good shape. Um, I'm a big component or a big fan of the standing desk. It just helps you get that better posture because a lot of the times when we're sitting at our desks, you know, we're at that hunched over. Let me show you the side profile here, the hunched over position, especially when you're typing. So the standing desk kind of helps you, forces you to be more upright. If you are someone at that with a desk type situation, uh, I like to do the, if I can back up for you, the VW stretch. So the, oh, let me get over here. <laughs> We do the V and then a W. So you just go into a V situation and then go to a W. So if you're on the webinar, give that a try. It just feels so good. Um, you know, it helps to reset the, the shoulders, which is great. Um, but yes, I'm a big component of the standing desk, but you're not going to get the cardio in with that. Um, and then also the uh, if you're looking for cardio to do at your desk, they actually do make some pretty awesome stuff. If, even if you go on Amazon, uh, they have like a little like leg cycling kind of situation. Uh, so you can get some cardio in that way through your desk. I forgot the what the name of it is. Um, you just put it on your desk and it just looks like a little pedal cycle that you could do. Um, and then if you want to take a break from work, uh, you know, just jogging in place, that's a really good one to do. Jumping jacks, you know, something to get that heart rate elevated for, for like a prolonged period of time. So love the question so far. Um, let's go on to the next one. We're not going to spend too much time on the actual math equation for this, uh, but I do have this in the PowerPoint. So if you guys want to actually do this equation yourself um, to find out what your target intensity should be for exercise when you look at heart rate. So to get to the cardiovascular intensity equation, you just need to know your age. So if you know your age, then you're, um, you're in good shape. Because what you do is you first have to determine your maximum heart rate. So your maximum heart rate is basically the number 220 minus your age. And then that'll get you your maximum heart rate. Uh, so for the, in this example, it's someone that's uh, um, 28 years old. I'm not, unfortunately. Um, it's 220 minus 28, and then that'll give that person a maximum heart rate of 192. Now, another common question that I get with the max heart rate, so let's say you now know your maximum heart rate. Let's say you're 28 years old, it's 192 and you're exercising on the treadmill, you're feeling really good, and then you notice that your heart rate goes above 192, then they like start to think like, oh no, am I gonna die? Is this really bad? Um, 
The answer is no. So if you're feeling okay, you could actually exercise close to your maximum heart rate because knowing that the 220 minus your age is just a prediction. Um, so if you are above you know, the 192, it doesn't mean that you're gonna die or if you exercise at that level, it's gonna be a really bad thing. Um, the, that 220 minus your age equation could be off plus or minus 20 beats in both directions. So that's a pretty big swing there. So the only way you could actually know your maximum heart rate is if you sign up to do one of those stress tests, which isn't a fun thing. Um, but we're just gonna use the equation because it works for most people. So you can see here, it's just the simple, simple uh, order of operations when it comes to like the math equation. You put your maximum heart rate in the equation if you look down below, uh, your resting heart rate, uh, you could just subtract that from your maximum heart rate. And then where, where it says times the intensity, that's gonna be really important. And then that's where you'd wanna refer back to the previous slide. Uh, because if you look at the previous slide here, if you're doing moderate intensity, let's say you want to do moderate intensity for, for cardio, you would do anywhere between 40 and 59% of your heart rate reserve. So going back to the equation where it says times intensity, if you want to go to the low end of moderate, you just do times the 40 or times 0.4 if you're doing it in terms of the, the math equation. And then you just plug in the numbers and I show an example down there at the bottom. This one's for someone who's looking to get 80% of their heart rate reserve. So it's gonna be a little bit of a higher intensity workout, uh, but it's just a really good tool to use if you're looking for like a target heart rate for, for that cardiovascular exercise. So I won't spend too much time on this, you know, definitely, you know, try to do this equation at home. Uh, you know, after we share the presentation, it's a really good tool. But now there is a disclaimer. When it comes to heart rate, there are so many um, fitness enthusiasts out there that, that just love heart rate. They're, they like ge geeking out with the different numbers that they get from their watches and um, their heart rate monitors. Heart rate is, in a way, a little imperfect as well. Uh, it's not the be-all, end-all. And I'm not going to knock heart rate, so don't feel like I'm um, you know, being like, don't never use your heart rate when it comes to working out. Uh, heart rate is a really valuable tool. Um, but when it comes to heart rate, it's just important to know that it's not perfect. So I want you guys to think if there's ever, think of like two activities that you do either frequently or that you've done in the past. The one that I have on my screen is running and biking. So when I run, within like the first two minutes, my heart rate gets up. It's like somewhere in the 170 range, um, you know, just from starting off exercising. I don't think it, I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, a lot of work, but it's not, it's not terrible. Um, but my heart rate is constantly higher when I run. But if I try to go on the bike, let's say my stationary bike inside my house, I could be working out really, really hard and my heart rate might only be at like 140. So I'm like, well, that's kind of odd. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much working at my same perceived uh, exertion for both modes of exercise, but one significantly higher than the other. And that's because your body is gonna adapt. Heart rate is basically a response to your, your body's perceived stress. So, um, you work different muscle groups when you when you ride the bike than you do running. So there's going to be some variability when it comes to um, which mode of exercise you choose. Like some people are like, oh yeah, I could get my heart rate really high in the elliptical. So is that better? It doesn't necessarily mean that it's better. It just means that your body's adapting to heart rate in different ways. Um, the environment could change your heart rate. So you could do the exact same intensity running outside and it's 40 degrees, change it to hopefully uh, in the coming days when it's 75, your heart rate might be a little bit higher. It doesn't mean that you're working harder in terms of the intensity, it just means that the environment's affecting your heart rate. So unfortunately, the only perfect way to kind of measure intensity with cardio is through measuring power or watts. 
So if we have uh, any cyclists on the webinar, you might have heard of something called power meters for your bike. Now, the problem with the power meters is they're expensive. So you need to drop a couple hundred bucks to, to, get, a, to get a power meter for your bike. So, um, so that's why the heart rates, it's, in, it's inexpensive. It works for most people. Um, so, you know, they always recommend that they use it if you don't have other resources. All right. So a special, another special note about heart rate. Medications could also play a role in your heart rate. So if you're on blood pressure medications, for example, a lot of them won't let you get above a certain heart rate. So it affects your, your heart to where like you could be exercising super hard and like your heart rate won't get above, you know, like a 120. And you're like, well, I'm trying to get to my target heart rate, but I can't do it. And that's because your medications might not allow you to do it. So it's always good to check with your doctor, especially if you wanna start using target heart rate as a way to determine your intensity. Um, you know, you could definitely do, you know, using something else instead, uh, which is, if you look on the screen, uh, this is a very common thing that uh, clients of ours will use. It's called the ratings of perceived exertion scale. And the RP scale for short, is just subjective. And this is such an underutilized tool that is so perfect because um, it's just how you feel the exercise was. So running on a treadmill, you might give yourself a, a 15, which you know is considered to be hard. So you would record that number if you're one of those paper pencil, you know, uh, exercise log recorders. Um, I, I really like using the RP scale uh, it just gives you a better feel of like, okay, this was a hard workout for me and I have a number to kind of quantify it. So this kind of satisfies the need of uh, all of our, uh, all, all of us trying to geek out with our numbers in terms of our fitness. This is a really good um, tool that you could use. Uh, one question, why is it numbered from six to 20? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, the reason why it's numbered from six to 20 and not like your typical one to 10 scales, if you multiply whatever number that's on here by 10, that is your estimated potential rest or your exercise heart rate. So in other words, if you gave yourself a 12 on the RP scale, you might have a heart rate around 120. Or if you gave yourself an 18 on the scale, it might mean that your heart rate might be around 180. So again, it's not perfect, but it's a really great tool because it's it looks at how you feel your body is doing during the workout. Um, let's see, we're going to get into some stretches. Let's see, there's a question here. Are there recommended st stretches before and after cardio and for how long? Um, that's a really good one. We might be jumping ahead, but it's a perfect place to add it. Um, if you are doing a cardiovascular workout, we don't recommend the static stretching before you actually do your, um, let's say run or, or biking. If you do static stretching, that could actually overstretch the fibers of your, of your muscles, which would limit how much power you're able to produce during the workout. But there are different types of stretches you could do other than the static stretches. So if you're new to stretching, static stretching are the ones you think about in, in like gym class where you're just kind of, you know, getting into like a, like a hamstring stretch, you know, reaching for your toes, uh, then holding it for, for, you know, 20, 30 seconds. Um, that's what a static stretch is. You're just static, meaning you're not moving. Uh, so this would be an example of a static stretch. You have it in one position and it's not moving. The stretches they recommend before running are dynamic warm-ups, what they call. Uh, so you might have seen people basically like skipping. That's a really good dynamic uh, uh, warm-up for running. Uh, just like the um, just like the high high legs like this. Yep, the Frankenstein walks as they like to call it. Uh, you know, doing lunges, things that, that get your heart rate up and moving and preparing movement patterns for whatever you're planning on doing. Butt kickers is a good one where you just literally kind of start running and try to kick your butt. 
Um, those are really good uh, dynamic warm ups that you could do uh, before before running. So I always recommend, you know, YouTube is actually pretty great when it comes to like d just typing in dynamic warm ups for running. Uh, you'll see a lot of good stuff out there. So definitely use YouTube as a good, you know, resource, believe it or not. All right, let's move on to resistance training. Yeah, so doing the strain stuff. Um, you can see here that in terms of the fit principle, I won't read this all off for you guys, um, but two to three days a week is the recommendation for the fit principle for resistance training. Um, uh, just, you know, making sure this is what you think about when it comes to weight stuff. Uh, you know, if you're going to be doing, uh, if you have weights at home, there's, uh, you know, you could use gallons of water. If you don't have that, there's eight pounds in a gallon of water, I believe. Uh, so, you know, you could use things that you don't necessarily need to buy a bunch of expensive weights uh, to get the resistance training in. So this is going to be what, what is separate from that cardio. Uh, let's see. So you don't want to use heart rate for intensity for doing a weight training workout. It's just not going to be accurate. So that RPE scale that I have on that previous slide will be a really good tool for you. Uh, then you can see the guidelines for sets, reps, and rest uh, that are on there too. So a set would be like, oh, I just did eight repetitions. Now I'm taking a break. That would be considered uh, a set. Um, the rest period is really important in between sets because depending on what you're trying to target, the rest period is going to be a big, big factor when it comes to getting your, your desired training goal. For example, if you're looking to get bigger, just like put on muscle, the rest period shouldn't actually be the two to three minutes that you see on the slide. It should be um, 30 seconds to a minute and a half. So if you're at the gym and you're, you know, seeing people working out and they're talking to their buddies about, you know, what's going on on like certain shows and then like, oh, let me get back to my, you know, weight set. Um, they're kind of wasting their workout depending on what their goal is. So again, if you're looking to get bigger, um, the rest period should be between 30 seconds and a minute and a half. The two, three minute rest interval between sets is more for strength. So if you're going to be targeting, like, I just want to lift as much as I can, that would be what you would recommend or what we would recommend for that. Um, another note about the intensity, once, um, you know, you start working with your personal trainer, they'll probably test you the very first day that, that you start working out. And they'll do something called uh, either one repetition max testing or multiple repetition max testing that they'll then use like, you know, Excel and uh, calculators to determine a percentage of your one repetition max so they can determine how much weight you should lift. Um, so that's the beauty of getting a good qualified personal trainer is they can use some of that science to, to target like, hey, if you're targeting getting bigger muscle wise, you know, 30 seconds to minute and a half rest between sets and, um, you know, for uh, the percentage of your one RM is going to be between 67 and 85 percent. So they're able to use these fancy numbers to to really target what you're hoping to achieve. Um, so just know that resistance training, you know, utilize the help of you know, fitness professionals if you, if you can. If not, you know, just start slow and then work your way up. So kind of that same principle as, uh, as with the cardio. Now, during the pandemic, uh, you're like, oh, I just don't know where to start. Um, there are a lot of great resources now, especially during the pandemic, for starting like a resistance training program. Um, I just listed a few on this slide. Tremont Athletic Club, BoFit, who's actually a former graduate of our program. And uh, he's um, he owns his own gym in North Royalton. Uh, and uh, the final one is T3 Performance on an Avon. If you look on their social media sites, they post live workouts daily and they're free. So, you know, just Google your gyms or if you, if you don't go to a gym, these are just good starting points. But if you have been to a gym before this is all started, there's a good chance that they're posting live free workouts 
you know, through Zoom or there's, you know, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, um, you know, just really good resources. You can even look back a couple of days and see what workout they did then. Um, they'll be there to kind of guide you uh, when it comes to starting, you know, just some simple body weight exercise workouts. Some of them might be a little bit more intense than others, but at least you can, you know, pause it if you need to. Um, it gives you a good starting point for sure. So definitely use that as a resource. Flexibility. So the the chair yoga that uh, someone uh, put in the chat. That's a really good example for just good in increasing flexibility. Yoga, um, stretching. The static stretching is good. Uh, it's just good to do after the workout. So after the workout, you could do things like your calf stretches and hamstring quad stretches. Again, if you're looking for examples of those, YouTube, fantastic. Uh, the, if you look on the screen, this is a uh, barrel roller or foam roller. You might have seen these inside, uh, you know, like Walmart, Target, sporting goods stores, uh, Amazon. There, that's a really great tool to, you know, really helping improve uh, your muscle before you start working out. So, um, for this one, just think about it. If your muscle is really tight. And it's really knotted. What happens when you, uh, oh, someone just put five below has them. So even cheaper. <laughs> so just think that if your muscle's really tight, think about a shoelace. What happens when you tie a shoelace multiple times in a row? What happens to the length of the shoelace? It gets smaller. So the same holds true to your muscles. So if your muscles are really knotted up, they're going to be smaller, more knotted. And you're not going to be able to get the most capacity out of using that same muscle. These foam rollers basically act like a self massage type situation. So you could roll it up and down on your back. You could roll out your quads, your calves. You could do pretty much anything with that. The good news is if you buy them, a lot of the times they'll come with like a DVD or like a download uh, for different exercises that you could do. Again, YouTube is a great resource. I have no affiliation with YouTube, but they are pretty good. Um, so that's just with the exercise. So just think, we just talked about the cardio, we talked about the weight training, we talked about flexibility. Now I just wanted to talk a little bit about nutrition. So there are so many great resources out there on the internet. Uh, oh, someone just put medicine ball. Yes, absolutely. Medicine balls work really well. Uh, if, if you don't have the foam roller, I forgot to mention, and you don't want to buy one, uh, cookie cutters or the cookie uh, rollers, I'm sorry. So those also work good, but you might need to get like a partner or someone to, to roll out the knot for you. Um, but yeah, the choosemyplate.gov is an awesome nutrition resource for you guys. It's free. Free is always good. Uh, and it's a little bit different than the way they used to have it. So some of you guys might have remembered uh, the Food Guide Pyramid. And I was not a fan of the Food Guide Pyramid. But it was so confusing. Like, what should I eat for breakfast? What should I eat for like, The Food Guide Pyramid's like, you know, eat the 8 to 10 servings a day. And, you know, it was kind of boring and it was really hard to visualize. The choosemyplate.gov is a really great representation of how much portion sizes you should be having per day. So if you look at the, the plate on the screen here, the one thing that should pop out to you guys is look at the size of the vegetable portion on the plate. So it's a lot bigger than the protein, um, the fruits, but the vegetables are like the, the, the main dish. Because in this new choosemyplate.gov recommendations, the protein is more like the side dish. And how many of us actually view pro the protein as a side dish? Um, this is just a really great resource. I'm going to show you an example. Um, they just created this not too long ago. It's a free app. I think it's available Android and iOS. Um, it's called the My Plate app. And you set targets for how many fruits, vegetables, and grains that you'll have per day. And you, you log it on the app. So it gives you that extra accountability. Again, it's free, so free is good. Um, and uh, it's just a really great resource. I've been using it myself. Uh, I'm trying to get more, more vegetables in. 
Um, so it's just a really good motivator. Uh, the other great thing about the nutrition side, here we go. So I just went in on the website and I put in my age, how much do I weigh, what's my activity level, and it actually spits out a meal plan for you based off what your, how many calories that you're looking to get a day. So it tells you how many calories you're, you're supposed to get a day. Uh, based off the information that you put into their system. And then it tells you to download the 3000 calorie a day meal plan for me. So I'm, I'm really active. So that's why I got more calories. Um, but then you can see for fruits, how much fruits, how much vegetables, how much grains, protein, dairy. Um, that's going to be really a really good snapshot of like giving you some free guidance as to what you should be eating. Um, let's see, I think I got a question here. So someone's been doing keto for a long time. What are your thoughts on this diet? Being protein should be considered as a side. Oh, yes. So that is a really good one. Uh, so the keto diet, um, I don't, I know some people are either like really for it or really against it. Um, for certain people, it works really well. Um, you know, it's going to definitely help you you know, trim down on some of that, that body fat, it, you know, it's not very carb friendly. Um, so, you know, you could have pretty much like whatever protein um, that you want and protein is really important for building muscle. Uh, so for some people, the keto diet works really well and they have no issues with it whatsoever. Their blood work looks really good. I've known some people that have done uh, the, um, the keto diet and it kind of had a bad effect on them because they had a family history of high cholesterol. So keto is like, Hey, yeah, go ahead, eat whatever protein or, you know, bacon, bacon's good. Um, but then they they get the, um, uh, their, their, um, their cholesterol or their lab work numbers back. And they're like, yeah, you probably shouldn't be eating all that stuff. Um, and from an exercise physiology standpoint, I guess the one thing that I don't necessarily like about the keto is that, as the person said up here, carbs are the enemy. Um, carbs are just your, your, your number one fuel source during exercise. So your body's going to want to use that carbohydrate to kind of, you know, save that muscle or to save that, um, that fat storage, uh, because fat is also going to be a really important for exercise as well. But carb is your number one fuel source for exercise. So you're kind of running without gas in the tank, as they would say. Um, but some people, your bodies are just kind of used to using the keto diet and it seems to work for them. Um, so I got, I have mixed feelings about keto. Um, it works for some people. It doesn't work for others. It's kind of like what I've noticed about it. But if you talk to other fitness professionals, they'll either be like, no keto or yes keto so it's kind of a mixed bag there uh, intermittent intermittent fasting was another question that i got um again i'm not really a, i'm not a dietitian uh but i've kind of same thing i've heard kind of mixed things about it um from my standpoint i like to think about it as like you have to keep on adding think about your metabolism as fire burning throughout the day and you got to keep on adding logs to the fire to keep it burning. So I'm always looking at it from like a performance standpoint, uh, <clears throat> you know, in terms of exercise. So um, I got mixed feelings about it. I know that it works for a lot of people. Uh, we do bod pod testing at Tri-C. Uh, once that reopens up again, it's a really accurate way to measure body composition. And you just won't believe how many people are doing keto and intermittent fasting and they're getting results. So that's the good thing. The one thing that I like to warn people about is, you know, get your lab work done just to make sure you're not, you know, messing with other areas like your blood cholesterol, especially glucose levels, because some of those require, you know, higher fat um, as part of the, the diet plan. So you just got to watch out for that kind of stuff. So I, again, I've seen where it works for people and I've seen where it doesn't. So it's kind of, Kind of interesting. <laughs> um, someone actually uh, sent in a question about Fitbits, and I meant to talk about that. Uh, Fitbits are great 
Apple watches. I got the Apple watch here. They're great. They help you um, stay motivated throughout the day. I'm like, oh no, I need to close my ring. Come on, I got to get some more exercise in. So from that standpoint, they're really good. Just note that that 10,000 steps a day is not going to be um, enough for that cardiovascular exercise recommendation. So if you get 10,000 steps a day, that's great. You're active during the day. That's exactly what you, we want you to do. But that in no way is going to replace that recommendation of, you know, if you're doing moderate stuff, 150 minutes a week of that planned exercise. So, you know, definitely um, Fitbits are great. I love them. They just keep you motivated. They keep track of your exercise. They're more advanced now when it comes to some of the metrics that they give you. Um, so again, I'm, I'm a fan. I like the bits, like, like the Apple Watches. They're just another motivational tool for you. Uh, is heart rate metric accurate? Um, kind of like what I was saying before, heart rate's going to be different depending on your environment. It's going to be different depending on your uh, mode of exercise. Like if you choose between a bike and a treadmill or elliptical, you could be working like harder on the elliptical, but it's not getting up that high. Uh, so the heart rate's just one of those general it's like the BMI. BMI is just your height and weight, and it classifies you as obese and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, normal weight. Um, so it's it's good for general population stuff, like categorizing people. But it, if you look at the BMI when you like bring it down to finer detail, you know, like LeBron James is considered obese on the BMI chart because it doesn't take into effect, you know, the the body fat percentage. So it's heart rate's kind of the same way. It's good for most kind of training situations, but when it comes to, uh, you know, like the be all end all, like heart rate, you have to use it to get good responses with your exercise. It's not, that's not really what it what it's there for. Um, should caloric intake be reduced as you get older? Um, I don't think that's necessarily um, the case. Um, it just kind of depends what your energy needs are. I always recommend a registered dietitian if you're really looking to get a for sure meal plan um, that's targeted to you specifically, a registered dietitian is a great resource or that myplate.gov because you're gonna put in your age, you're gonna put in your um, uh, fitness status and then it's gonna spit out how many calories you should, you should be doing. And that was created by, um, you know, by, you know, medical doctors and, and dietitians. So I always like to take their advice over mine in terms of the diet stuff. But I know the general the general diet recommendations. I know we got a few minutes left, um, but I always like this slide. One of my favorites is fuel your superpower. So it kind of goes back to like the training, uh, eat like how you train. Because uh, all these different fruits and vegetables give you different um, different qualities. So yellow foods optimize brain function, orange foods support skin uh, and different tissues, white foods enhancing the immune system. So thinking about it from a color standpoint, like eating the rainbow is going to be really a good healthy tool for you guys. Uh, so this slide's on the PowerPoint. I know we're running short on time, so we'll move on. My favorite rule is the 80-20 rule. 80% um, of the time, eat healthy, eat the good stuff. 20% of the time, you know, you might want to, uh, you know, eat the foods that what they like to say is feed your soul. So I'm a big French toast fan. I love barbecue. I'm one of those people that I'll get a pulled pork sandwich, I'll get some fries, and I'll get a sweet tea, like a large sweet tea. But I don't do that every day. So it's that 80-20 rule that I really heard from a lot of people, a lot of dietitians love it, because they don't make you get rid of something. The one complaint that I hear about like the keto or, um, you know, just some of the different diets that are out there is they're, they're, you're making yourself get rid of something. So in terms of like long-term maintenance, it's very difficult to say like, you'll never eat this again. Uh, so if you just eat in moderation, and eat healthy that 80% of the time, that tends to work best. That's why Weight Watchers has really been a very productive program is because they don't make you get rid of anything. 
If you do decide to have that, you know, French toast, uh, you know, for breakfast with like extra sugar, that's going to be like the bulk of your points for the day. So then you have to kind of modify the rest of it. So big fan of Weight Watchers. When it comes to losing weight, that's a really good one. Stress management. I know we're not going to have much time to talk about that. So maybe even we could even set up a uh, another webinar if you guys want, either on stress or a different topic. Exercise is going to help with stress. Use those apps that are out there for visualization, meditation, deep breathing. Uh, those are really great resources. I don't have a really good stress management voice like the, all right. Take a deep breath, relax. So you'll want to download someone else's voice instead. Um, but there, there's just so many great resources online, YouTube, um, the call map someone said, I've used that before, I love it. Uh, Headspace is another one. Um, so there are some free resources that are out there. Um, so I can't really give you a whole bunch of stress management like specific advice, because there's just so many experts that are out there that are already putting out great content. If you don't have apps, deep breathing is going to be the simplest one you could do. Breathing in through your nose, and then out through pursed lips, like, or you could do like your Darth Vader voice. That's actually a really good uh, way to get uh, the, the deep breathing in. So I didn't want to like hopefully skew this to where like, well, Chris talked about exercise 60% of the time, nutrition 30, stress 10, like, so that must be what's important. That's not the case. Um, you want to try to in incorporate uh, all these different areas to live a good, healthy life. Um, so yeah, like I said, if you guys have additional questions, I think we have a few minutes for, for time. Um, and if there's a certain yeah. topic that you want to hear uh, about um, that you want me to do another presentation on, like specifically related to running or or whatever, uh, definitely let us know. But we'll go ahead and see. Uh, Jerry, do we have uh, any other questions here? Or are we sure? Yeah. No, we, we do have a couple of them. I, I wanted to go back and, and make sure we got them. One was um, we have one person, one gentleman uh, uses a glider type machine and a rower and some of the other kind of more low impact. Is that really a best way to get started? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I love the rower, low impact. I saw there was a video on uh, Instagram and there was like a, she was like 95 and she was rowing. She's able to do that because it's, you know, it's a really good low impact activity. So I always recommend if you're worried about like, oh, I've just had a bad history of when I exercise, I, I get injured. Those low impact activities, like I mentioned, um, you know, biking, walking, those are going to be great ways for you to just start back in. So don't do too much too soon is the big key. Um, Excellent. Sometimes, sometimes you might get some of those exercise videos that there's a lot of like jumping and plyometric stuff. Now, those aren't going to be good if you're just starting because it's you're going to increase the, the chance for injury. Excellent. Excellent. And I know a lot of people are dealing and very sad that their gyms and fitness centers are closed right now. Uh, do you have any advice for creative exercises that they can do during this time when they don't have equipment at home? Yeah, um, definitely. I mentioned, I know I said the walking, um, but, you know, if you have stairs in your apartment or house going up and down the stairs, you know, you don't need the fancy equipment to get your heart rate up because that's really what we're looking to get you to do is get your heart rate up. Um, so you can do like the stairs, you could transform everyday household items to weights. I've seen, well, I've seen the, the gallons of milk, don't use milk, it'll probably spoil uh, <laughs> or spill. Um, so you use gallons of water. I've seen people use book bags, you know, they'll stuff some old book bags or suitcases and they'll do different, you know, pressing exercises with it. We just want you to get you guys moving. Um, so I know a lot of the parks are still open. So the weather is gonna turn hopefully. Uh, so you can get some walks in uh, over there, runs or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Great, Chris. Thank you. I I feel so bad that we've run out of time. This has been fantastic, and I know we've got a few more questions, but maybe we can respond to them afterwards. But. Um, I, on behalf of everybody here at Corporate College, thank you so much, Chris, for this uh, great program, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, you know, I I really love that, especially that VW stretch. That was a new one for me, so thank you for that, Chris. <laughs>
So, and so remember, you know, Chris uh, leads the Tri-C Sports and Exercise Studies Program. It really prepares students for careers as personal trainers. You can sign up to be a client in one of those personal trainer sessions. I've done it and highly, highly, highly recommend it. Uh, he also has uh, programs for fitness specialists and other health related professions. You know, please visit the try-c.edu slash exercise for more information about that, or instead of slash exercise slash fitness to find out um, other fitness testing and training center services that are offered to everybody here in the general public. And it includes body composition testing, personal training service, and metabolic testing. And please don't forget, Corporate College is here to serve you with essential learnings to overcome the challenges you may be facing right now. And we offer that through virtual classroom, our fabulous instructors and facilitators like Chris to provide you that training, consultation services or coaching. So please visit our Corporate College website and feel free to rewatch this session at the page where it says uh, free webinar series. You can even share it with your friends and always stay up to date with us by following us on social media. So on behalf of Chris and everyone, thank you all for joining us today and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Chris. Right, thanks everyone.